All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the May 2nd Government Relations and Communications Committee meeting. Let's begin with our introductions and administrative remarks. Absent any introductions, I'll go <laughs> with the administrative remarks. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, uh, bring the committee up to speed in regards to the uh, federal legislators uh, that we're inviting uh, to speak in June. Uh, last week I was down in uh, D.C. meeting with uh, our, and I stopped by our legislators' offices. Around the same time was when our committee meeting here got moved up because of various reasons, because we were supposed to meet at 7. Uh, so I, I, now that I know that our meeting definitely is at 7 o'clock in June, I can confirm with them to see uh, regarding their attendance. Uh, but they all, everyone seemed interested in, in sending a rep. Uh, we just had to confirm the time. Um, in regards to the September uh, breakfast, uh, I know we discussed uh, perhaps having that be something different uh, this year. And I, f from what I recall, we were uh, discussing pairing with uh, the League of Women Voters to do something similar to what occurred at Wallingford Swarthmore. And we're I think, about yeah, we, were, it. we, we were, talked about exploring the possibility of it, keeping, if everybody, I, you guys might remember better than I do. I watched mm -hmm. the tape again just to try to jog my memory, but I think we are going to go forward potentially with the same thing we had as plan A, but also discuss plan B, which would be a dinner where we would all be meeting like we do for the breakfast, and then after that have the, the town hall. Like, see if we could pull that off for September and if that looks preferable to what we typically do. So kind of working two scenarios at so the same both. time. Okay, so I'll reach out to them and see what uh, their availability, availability is. What is. What is the preference? Like, you know, because we have two things, you know, they might ask us, you know, what do they really, what do you guys really prefer? Do you prefer the, uh, you know, like an opportunity for the board to meet prior to a town hall? Or, do, you know, if it comes down to their availability in, in September, they're, they're generally not. Their ability, yeah, availability, uh, the, our, our, the legislators? Our local state okay. reps. And so uh, in the past, we, we like, as I mentioned before, we do September because they're not back in session yet. So generally they have more availability. So they, they might be, it might be preferable to do the town hall at the same time. You know, I mean, so like, is that the preference that we go with that? And if they can't do that, like yeah. do a dinner and then a town hall or? I think we're trying to get the best of both worlds, which would be have a chance to meet like we've done in the breakfast where it's board members, administrators, the legislators, just to sort of do that bonding thing. And then afterwards expand it in, to conduct a town hall so that the public can also get the benefit of some questions for the legislators. I mean, that would be, I, what do you guys think? I think that would be something, but what I would look for with the town hall, because um, what some people are doing is they mix the legislators and we would invite their staff also, would be in the tables around. Okay. So then people would just be sitting there and it would, it would be a, a kind of, a, of an informal, rather than putting them on the spot with a series of questions about these different, different um, things. And then you offer the legislators an opportunity to talk about what they want to talk about, trying to keep it positive. Because in the past, we've had some questions coming up that were, were not directed in a positive manner. So I think what we want to do is invite our legislators to come in with the topics, okay? They'll talk about that with the board at that, at that point during our dinner. And then it would fold into a town meeting where they could start off with, these are the things that they want to talk about, and then break off into little groups with, with the people. What do you think, Mike? Yeah, I agree with Chuck. I mean, th they might not be receptive to a town hall thing because, you know, that can just turn into a rant-a-thon with, you know, one angry old man in the back. I mean, I've seen that happen. <laughs> um, so I would see what they would prefer. Myself. I've, I've, we, yeah. Do you resemble? You know, do you resemble? <laughs> <laughs> I resemble that Fifth Amendment here. Uh, but you know, see what they would prefer. You know more. I, the the one the breakfast that we had last year was probably more productive than a than um, the town hall thing would be just for us on a selfish level. Mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the dinner would be similar. Well, yeah. I mean, the breakfast. thought I think was that the dinner would. I don't be, think would you're going to get similar to do both. No. You know. I don't know. Um, With the town hall in the end of dinner. Well, I mean. 
It'd be a the long breakfast. Time. Oh no, and no, the town oh, hall. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're not going to want to. No, they're not going to want to. No, this would just be. That's why I was wondering, like, what's if we prefer a dinner. You know, like an hour, like we feed and then them. an hour. Yeah, well, I know. People, get people <laughs> I know, in to, to eat, and people then come maybe for like food. an hour and a half to yeah. talk. And, and again, uh, when we were speaking about this, and you know, we also, uh, you know, we're talking about pairing up with the League of Women Voters regarding the the coordination of the mm -hmm. town hall. Uh, yeah. Because that Plus, sounds like a much larger event than we're used to pulling off. Other, I don't know how much legislators are going to want to come to a town hall where there's more than one of them. You know, where they have to share it with another legislature, well, what legislator yeah. who's at see, a different party. Yeah, no, see, know, I guess we were talking about the Wallingford to Swarthmore Wallingford. one. I think also, as I reviewed the tape, you were going to talk to Lisa Palmer potentially at Wallingford Swarthmore to see how her whole thing came about because I didn't, that was again the three state reps who serve that district. They were all on the stage together, although one actually wasn't there, the rep was there. But um, McGarrigal and Branicky were right next to each other. There were questions, it was billed as an education town hall. Um, mm -hmm. And so all of the questions were geared around any legislative issues that had to do with education. Mm -hmm. and. They, I think they really liked the chance to be able to speak to their positions, and frankly, they were in agreement on most of them. You know, when it comes to charter reform, pension reform, those were the kind of questions that came up. It seemed to be very peaceful, and it's a great platform for them because it gets the room was about 200 people, and they get a chance to speak to their constituents about their positions on things. Right, but so we should I see what, what our guys want to do because our guys are different. You know, oh yeah, we can I mean, pose that to our legislators. I think that I think they would be somewhat receptive and to maybe how we want to do it. Maybe Lisa Palmer has a certain way that she approached her legislators that would be a model for us to follow or something. I think just touching base with Wallingford, since their event by all accounts seemed to go really well, might give us some direction or not of how we would approach ours. Not that it would have to be the same, but she could have some good insights for us. Well they sent a blast out to all the parents. So they blasted things out. And it was it was driven by not the uh, the school district itself. I think there was a lot of uh, by itself. It was a lot of momentum coming from teachers, coming from the parents community. that want and the community that wanted it to happen. So, uh, and when politicians realize that the community wants to hear them, they usually will come. I think they'll come. I think a good opportunity for that, it, it, it lends itself to uh, the DCIU legislative uh, breakfast, where a lot of our reps presumably will be, uh, but then also Lisa Palmer, because uh, we don't uh, float in the same circles. Uh, so we can uh, touch base with her. I believe that's May 19th right. uh, to see how right. she set that up. So that would be great. I can get back well, to you the one that the, our legislative council, the, the, how they're going to arrange that is the legislators are sitting in tables okay. with people that they represent. There, there's not a, a uh, an opportunity for you to question the legislators. Uh, it's just to get familiar with them, to talk to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It's, it's a very friendly um, time because in the past it did become very um, unruly when it became uh, when the school boards were at odds sometimes with the politicians who, were, who represented us, and that was an opportunity for school boards to take it out on them. So we do want to stay away from that piece. Yeah, and maybe you know I think one, and I thought one of the things we talked about last time too. We just want to think about is, um, you know, timing. You know, we have the breakfast that we've traditionally done, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know maybe we you know still look at having that if there is something as you said we can do differently, or maybe what we do different happens. You know, I want to talk to Lisa. Was there a reason they did it the time of year they did? It might be easier at that time of year to attract. Um, you know, the, the legislators might be easier time also for scheduling with parents. So if we have something already in the fall, I mean, I'm, I'm just worried about timing. And as we talk to everyone, to f you know, to put this together, maybe it's something that we're looking, you know, we do our traditional breakfast and then we do something more in the March, April time period or, you know, so February, March, something yep. in that. Yep. And then we can also have time to talk to them about what would the format, what would be optimal format? Because I've experienced both of those where there's been a, um, you know, a panel and with with a neutral person asking questions, which I think could be very positive. Mm -hmm. But I like your idea, Chuck. Also, sometimes when you have an opportunity for a small, 
you know, table discussions uh, can be really beneficial for everybody involved, too, you know. Especially so. if they bring their staff. But right, they can bring their staff. I mean, so there's, we could look at a couple different formats. Mm -hmm. I just would worry that that might be a lot to, to put together for the fall, I don't wanna, and I don't want to lose the momentum for a breakfast that seems like it's worked well, too. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we changed up the format of our legislative breakfast this year. Remember, mm -hmm. Kevin, and what we did differently was that we thought of issues and topics ahead of time and sent them off to our legislators to say, just so you know, these are the kinds of things that we'll want to talk about, and that hadn't been done in the, in the past. So I'm just wondering if going forward, even for the June visit, if it would be beneficial for us to give them some kind of direction in what they want to cover, because they could probably be here for hours. They mm -hmm. come with stacks of notes. Do you think that it makes sense, you, all of you, to well, give some them some, yeah, some bring some specific topics with. to them and to focus their conversation with us? Uh, well, I mean, just because I know this is your first breakfast, we've always provided uh, our local reps uh, themes of what we were going to talk about in advance. We give it to them 10 days before they come so they aren't blindsided and so they can pr appropriately prepare for the breakfast. Uh, for, the, uh, for the June meeting, uh, typically because there aren't a lot of education topics that are happening in D.C. Uh, other than, you know, the ESSA uh, um, reauthorization, uh, we've asked them to send to us, uh, you know, what are some hot topics, you know, what's sort of going on on the, on the hill, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then I send it out to you guys, and, and we ask, you know, sort of get consensus on, like, you know, what are some, like, three things that we want them to prep on. Uh, so that they can give a little bit more detailed uh, uh, response to you and be prepared to answer questions that you might have. Uh, so if we want to do something different, we can. Uh, it's just that um, I met with some of the legislative reps last week uh, from the various, you know, from uh, our various senators, and um, it might be more advantageous to find out what they're sort of experts at. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're not all experts of every piece of education legislation, uh, and um, and nor are we are we knowledgeable all this all the stuff that's happening now that there's a new administration and a new secretary of ed. Uh, so it might be good for us this year to uh, leave a little bit more broad. Mm -hmm. You know, what do they envision? I mean, one of the topics that will that's in the DCIU update uh, that we'll be discussing is um, a, a review of the. Uh, the uh, Federal Department of Education. Uh, so what does that entail? Uh, what do they envision that might, that could come out of that? Do they have any thoughts on what that could look like? Uh, and, um, you know, try to use that as, a, as an information uh, session for us. Um, because there was topics that I asked about last week that they weren't familiar with. Uh, and nor can they be. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're a staff of, you know, five to six people, and they have education as one of the hats they wear. You know, so um, you know, we, we also want to respect that. So uh, I'll I'll reach out to them to confirm that they're sending the right okay. folks, and that uh, to see how maybe you know what they suggest would be the best way. Because we want to obviously frame our reps in a positive light, as Chuck said. We're, we're not here to do an I gotcha with people. Right. Right. Good. Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> I can got gotcha. you. Uh, you're up for um, admin can, remarks or writing no, to the agenda? No, they'll all be included in my okay. presentation. Okay, so it's time for some public comment. Thank you, by the way, everybody, for that discussion. Good evening. Mrs. Sherry, it's evening now, right? Yes. yes. Technically. Judy Sherry, Governor Circle, Newtown Square. I, in the minutes and prior meetings, I questioned what the total cost of broadcasting meetings live from the administration building would be. You know what, Mrs. Sherry? I think there was an update in, in our... Michael, didn't you have something? I had printed it out from our... Um, Board update that you had a little bit more information, not much, but you had a little bit more information on that in in here, right? Yes, we. Um, I can't go over the details, but we are looking at an alternate funding source for um, the TV studio and to get this room equipped with 
uh, the ability to broadcast live. So that is still in, in the process of being reviewed. And rest assured that we will keep looking into it until we come to a resolution. Sorry for and interrupting, but I wanted no, to. No, I appreciate that. I'd really like to hear a timeline for that because, you know, it just it seems like it's dragging on and on. And you had the amount for what it costs to change your equipment. I wouldn't think it would be that difficult to find out what labor would cost in terms of installing it. So, um, so I would appreciate that attention to that or some time frame. And um, in the communication survey questions, um, the survey results state that on page uh, three that a public survey will be next step public survey on page three. And I'd like to know when will that be taking place and will the questions be available in advance to that being sent out? So that's um, one thing. And then it's a couple of questions related to the communication survey that's being discussed tonight. And on page four, it's survey results overview parents. When I looked at this, the display of the information, I looked at majority of respondents, RMS parents, 42, RHS, 39, and Wayne Elementary, 23. I mistakenly added those up thinking, okay, that's going to be my total number, 100% of the response. But that's not, that's not really the correct approach because I came up with 106 percent response and I know that we weren't that great that we got 106 percent response so then I, it occurred to me okay then this must be the number the percentage of middle school parents that participated 42 percent high school 39 Wayne Elementary 23 but we're missing Ethan and Radner and I think that should be an important part even if it wasn't as robust a, per, a percentage as Wayne so I'd like to see and know what happened with Ethan and um, Radner. On page five, this is just my quick summary of, some th of things that sort of jumped out at me. Um, it looks to me that satisfaction, and this was satisfaction about available information from parents, I guess. And so it looks like to me that 40% of the respondents are not satisfied with available information. That's how I assess that because I figured if you're satisfied, you're blue, and if you're not quite satisfied, <coughs> you're orange. Um, and uh, then on page five, the sources that you regularly access, I noticed that the district's TV station had very poor results, which I would like to bring forward may be something that you should look at the quality of the programming and the scheduling of the programming. Because I'm always interested in the district and I have to admit that I have not been watching it. So um, I think it would be, you know, it's, it's a nice, it's a wonderful resource the district has to have this channel. So it should try to maximize its um, ability to communicate through the channel. And then my only other comment was on page 10, it looked to me that most of the staff was not dissatisfied with the communication between buildings. And that's the only comment that I really had about that. So um, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Public comment? Good evening, Mrs. Good Spurtle. Good evening. Cindy Spurtle Wayne. A um, couple questions on the survey that came forward. And that, and we, uh, you had discussed, Michael, and had been discussed by the committee how important the wording of the questions are. And it appears to me that a reason might be, and just the way I interpreted it, in slide number five, it shows on the right-hand side 
<clears throat> the survey is asking to please select the sources you regularly access for information, this is to the parents, about programs, events, initiatives, et cetera, happening at your children's school, child children's school or throughout the district. And laughingly, I guess you could say, your children happens to be very dissatisfied. In other words, can't rely on the kids. But if you go to the next slide, six, it, it says, please rate your general level of satisfaction with the amount, accessibility, and presentation of information you receive from each of the below sources, which is very similar. And if you go down to the bottom, they're very happy, or at least satisfied with going to the children for information. So I'm curious how that one was interpreted, I think. I mean, that's the way I look at it. I will be going over the it's, survey Yeah, it's your results. children, and according to the color, it means they're very dissatisfied on the five, and then on six, they do go to the children, and I think it's the way it's I worded. Think, well, I think actually what um, Mike Miller was saying is that it's not your children, it's your children's something or other, like your children's teachers or your children's newsletters That's or something well, like that. It was cut off. Yeah, I'll have to. Yeah. Mr. Petit is going to have the full thing. With well, that's what I think. I know. And I would. <laughs> the other, which might have been helpful uh, on slide seven is the, under staff, is the number of respondents were a total were 198 and would have been a help for anyone reviewing this myself included, not having to go back and research exactly how many teachers there are, support staff and administrators. In other words, 133 teachers responded. That's what percentage of the total teacher population is all. And that would, that would be a help. And uh, my comment is I am looking forward to the end of this discussion where there are areas that you're going to zero in on based on the answers that were given, that were weak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other public comment? Seeing none, let's move on to agenda item number one, where Mr. Petiti will give us an update. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, approval of minutes. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I guess Mr. Miller is thumbs up. Okay. Second. Uh, minutes are approved. Moving on to the communications policy update from Mr. Petiti. Okay, I apologize for having to use two computers here, but uh, my desktop is being serviced, so I wasn't able to print my notes, so I have to refer to my laptop. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was just make sure we all are on schedule with the timeline, um, and you know, everybody's kind of up to date on where we are. Um, the good news is that we were at the policy committee meeting. The policy itself, communications policy, was moved for a first read, so we are in good shape with uh, having that hopefully ready for next school year. Um, the ARs continue to be developed. I'll go over those a little bit later. Um, I guess should say going over the outline of those. And um, this meeting obviously is going, is going to entail a review of the survey. So we are again on schedule with our timeline. Michael, thank you very much for that. I was just wondering, I noticed you've updated it to keep it current with where we are. Mm. Do you have it as a master, like from beginning to end, if anybody wanted to follow your timeline to develop, say, another policy someday or something? Because it was a really good template. Sure. I, yeah, this is just a screenshot of the May forward. Okay. I have the whole thing on a regular file. So, and again, we went over this last meeting, but I, it's nice to refresh everyone's memory as a purpose for the survey. It was to help with guiding our AR development to establish some baselines. We wanted to really take a look at internal communication, how we were doing, and as I believe Ms. Um, Sherry referred to, between buildings and um, in the building itself. And then we promoted it extensively over about two weeks to make sure that we had as many responses as we could get. Start with the parent survey. The number of responses, responses we had was 439. The uh, majority of them were from the middle school. The reason why they don't add up to 100 is because they also account for people can select multiple schools. So if you had a student in the middle school and the high school, you could pick both. So that's why it goes over 100%. The uh, 
the majority of people have been in the school district for one to five years, which is very interesting. So I'm going to be able to tease that information out and be able to see how our new parents are feeling about communication, which I think that's going to be really helpful for targeting our communication to those different segments of parents. And you can see the rest here. Um, what really kind of stands out as well is the, and we know this probably incidentally or anecdotally, is the mobile usage of our, uh, of the people who access information from our our district. We want to make sure that we kind of refocus on how we're presenting things on phones and tablets. And again, that's something we probably haven't realized, but the numbers bear it out. What about, back to that, does the West number include Ethan and Radnor Elementary? Those numbers are just the top three. Um, I can pull so the... West and Radnor and Ethan are below the 20. So Radnor and so Ethan were... By each, but, okay. Yes, the, I have those numbers, but I didn't put them on the slide. We did, yes, we certainly did. So I added to what you don't have, I added numbers. I thought it would be easier to see. And um, so these are all the breakdowns of, on the one left-hand side, the question is, please indicate your general level of satisfaction with the amount of available information regarding the following subjects. And uh, the numbers you see here are just adding up the very satisfied and the satisfied. And you'll see what really what stands out here is um, the 50, below 50 percent. That's that was what I looked at throughout this survey to see. Um, that's your what's regularly happening in your classrooms. That is what that 47.46 percent is. What's regularly happening in your classrooms. So when I see something below 50 percent in terms of people being satisfied or very satisfied, it m m that is what I kind of gear my mind to. What we need to improve. Uh, we need to find a way to make sure parents know what's happening in the class. Potentially, that I would argue that's the most important thing that we want parents to understand. Um, from there forward, um, the highest response and satisfaction was our was information being conveyed on school and district events. That 82 percent, approximately. Actually, that's the second highest. The highest was student, staff, and school achievements. So where we're succeeding is in the PR side of communications. We're exceeding. We're, we're um, excelling at telling our story in a positive way and letting people know that we do, you know, to the public facing, we do good things and our students achieve and our schools achieve. You'll see later on it's the internal stuff that we need to focus on and that's kind of been something that I've been wanting to examine for some time now. Excuse me, Michael, can I just mention, you got, a, I would say, I guess, a fair number of comments to go along with these responses, right? So you don't have to really intuit what needs to be done. Did, would you say you got a a pretty healthy dose of direction from these comments? Yes, there is. Uh, I've been going through the comments. There's some themes that I'm pulling out that I later on in this presentation you'll see some of the themes that came through the parent and the staff surveys. But yes, the comments do reveal a good amount about some things we can do to improve. On the other side, you'll see, um, again, as Spurtle referenced, the circles here are on the RAD TV, and that's the people who regularly access information about programs, et cetera, only 2.76 percent of the 430-some respondents said that set our TV station. Uh, it's a glaring need for us to focus on what we're providing on that station. And Nikki, uh, our TV studio director, has done a phenomenal job through the years, and, but we've already been in contact with what we can do to, to better our product there, and um, that is definitely going to be a focus of mine hours and your children the 67.74 percent is actually where I would say the top of the top three where people are getting their information which you don't you know again it's something that we would figure but it shows the importance of keeping our students informed and and putting forth um, you know accurate and reliable information in the classroom you know in hallways um, through the announcements etc because those kids are going home and talking to their parents obviously and 68 percent of our parents get their information from our kids um, on the flip side of that we want to make sure that we give them the opportunity to get that information from us so what is it that they're getting maybe from the students that we would like them to come to us to also get information from and where we can improve in the delivery of that type of information just looking at that with the um it mentions here because uh, we don't have the put full, your thing on. Uh, we, we don't have the full language yes. of the of the questions. 
Uh, flyers or letters sent? I guess I'm assuming that's flyers or letters sent home with a student? Yes. Okay. So that's 51% get their information, flyers, letters sent home. Um, district website is the first one. Official district newsletter, that's the Radnor Reader, that's a 60.83%. Um, the lower ones you see are traditional media, so that's print TV, that's 6.9%, print TV, radio. Um, the school's front office, 8.06%. I was a little surprised by that. I was expecting to see more information being shared out of our front offices. So I pulled that number um, per building, and it does show some buildings are giving as much as 13%. Um, parents are getting information from front offices, while other ones are getting as low as 3%. So where is the consistency there with what we're providing? Is it just an elementary school versus a high school thing? Um, there's a lot we can get from this, and one of the main things that, that you'll see is the consistency in communication throughout the district. Some are excelling, others need work in terms of um, apartments and buildings. Uh, Michael, uh, Mike Miller, did I saw your finger near the mic button. Did you have a question? If I did, I'd ask. Okay, just wanted to know. Um, <laughs> I um, wanted to ask you if, when you mentioned the TV station, you were talking about the quality of the product you offer. Do you think it's a matter of that or just people's awareness that there is such a station? I think that it's a combination. Um, Later on, you'll see the Radnor rate, which is the Radnor High School's newspaper, also kind of had a low response rate for people that read it. Um, and that could be because we're not promoting the articles enough. That could be because we're, you know, we're not, they're not aware that it's for people beyond the high school in terms of like, the accessibility of the content. So we are looking at how we can get the word out more about what's on Rad TV. But I also think it involves the fact that there's no um, on-demand currently ability to pull up Radnor Rad TV on demand on Comcast, so you can't just go to the on demand thing and pull up any show. Um, we don't have the ability to show a guide on Comcast when something's going to be on. It just says educational access channel, so people can't say if it says you know the play or, or um, you know STEM night or something. Um, those kind of things we're working with Comcast to hopefully allow them to provide us so we can have a guide so people who are scrolling through can even set their DVR to record some things. Um, so we're moving in the direction to improve it beyond the TV studio. Mike, uh, you, you mentioned, it looks like the district website. What about, I, I would have guessed that parents would be going to their school's website. Was uh, that? Yes, it's, it's possible that they just lumped them together. I can't be certain, but I look at that as just the website, gotcha. you know, wherever it may lead them. There's a good amount to go over, so I'll try to get through it quickly. But I, I can, and obviously, this presentation is available on the website if um, people want to check it out. The uh, satisfaction with the information people receive from the below sources. Next page. I circled the lower half, which is district administration, school administration, and your children's teachers 42, 52, and 62. And then the one above that is school board. 39. Those are things that um, are internal, uh, employee-driven communication, ways that, you know, we should be, as, a, as employees generally, helping communicate out through, um, you know, ourselves on a regular basis. So we'll have to figure out where, where what are we not getting parents that they're looking for from, from us as staff. The second side, I think, would actually help us maybe alleviate that, and that's the plus 82.63 percent across the board that want to see more use of school messenger um, that's our alert system for school delays and closures for school and district-wide um, emergencies for time sensitive information um, for time sensitive information from the district as well as the school and for select information about achievements and accomplishments all above 80 percent and people that want to see us use School Messenger more to get that information to them. Now, that might not be a call. Uh, it could be a text or an email. But people want us to use the service more. I have two quick questions, Michael. In terms of the school board situation, you added that nice section on the Radnor Reader. Do you think when we do something like that, maybe it could be accompanied by an announcement, like we've added this section to our Radnor Reader to feature school board with a little explanation about why? Do you think 
if we are, when we expand and address communication needs, maybe we could consider communicating about how these communication changes, bring them to people's attention, and even say in response to the survey we've received. I know sometimes when people take surveys, they're not always sure that the surveys go anywhere, and I think it makes people feel like their time was best, better, was well spent to fill out the survey if we reference the survey and bring attention to changes we've made as a result of it. Sure. Uh, you know, I, we have I have intentions to kind of try to get this information out um, more publicly, so that could be a way to do that. And just note that, uh, you know, as I look at that, you know, I see how um, in that last part, select information, you know, where it is about 80 percent, but then all of a sudden the blue does start to tick up. The no starts to tick up in that yes. spot. And, uh, and I think we just discussed the idea of maybe doing some focus groups with some of these this information because I wonder if that would be an area that if we did do more, would we start to see that blue grow <laughs> or not? You're totally right. It's it's one of those very th fine line between oversaturation and just enough. Mm -hmm. So we we could do s sample some small kind of testing with sending messages out and then check out the response rate through our service and see if it starts to decline or we start to get some feedback, negative feedback. Okay, so I circled these, but I just went over those already. Um, I wanted to circle actually your children and teachers because it's interesting that 62% of the people are satisfied or very satisfied with what comes from the children and teachers, but then uh, you'll see in the slide prior to, um, there is a lesser number. I don't know where it went, but um, what's regularly happening in your classrooms. So you would think that 67% of people are satisfied with what's coming from the children's teachers, but 47% are only, only 47% are happy with what's regularly happening in their classrooms. What's going on with that 20% there? Does that make sense? So I just saw those two numbers and I thought, well, they should be more consistent. Um, why that 20%? change? Is that something the district needs to work on uh, you know, globally, like getting information out from the classrooms that teachers don't provide? Wait, were Mike, were you saying that they, it, one is about whether you get it, and the other is what you hear once you get it. Right. <laughs> it's like, you know, a teacher may not communicate with you all the time, but, you know, when he does, it's good information. It's just that they don't do it a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know? And then there was a question at the beginning of the meeting, too, about how many were satisfied just looking at satisfied, but you've combined satisfied and very satisfied, so it's a little higher percentage than the comment at the beginning. Does that make sense? Yes. Am I understanding that? Yeah. Yes, I've combined it. There's also a somewhat satisfied, which is the orange. We could always throw that in there, too. Um, but I just prefer people to be satisfied. Yeah. So okay. okay, so we're going to move on to the staff. Staff respondents, we had 198 total. Thank you to the teachers and th everyone who's responded, but thanks especially to the teachers in RTEA for getting the word out to, to a large degree to have 133 re three responses. And the tenure of respondents, the highest, were the, are, you know, veterans, 10 plus years. Again, um, these are very satisfied and satisfied. The first question is how generally, how informed do you generally feel about the following subjects in RTSD? And you can see that the lower ones involve budget, school board happenings, and district initiatives, um, all below 40%. Um, also, the last one is information to help you do your job to the best of your ability, and that's at 50%, which is another thing that we want to maybe take a look at. What, I don't know, how could we zero in on that, maybe in the comments or something? That's why I circled these areas here. They're the lower lower uh, rungs. And uh, same thing with please indicate your general level of satisfaction with the amount of information available on the following subjects. We, again, see school board, um, budget, and interestingly, information about faculty achievements um, and, and faculty bios. So that kind of goes back to um, what we had talked about in the past of doing more um, teacher um, appreciation stuff or teacher features um, and also including me with their bios in a, in a different capacity on the website or elsewhere to let people know who, who they're working alongside and you know what what they're like outside of the school day if they want to share that information of course 
Please select the sources you regularly access for information about programs, events, initiatives, etc. Um, the highest we see here again on the district website. Um, another thing that was big that came through the survey was how important word of mouth is. We all, you know, again, we all know it, but people talk to each other, and it's very important. That's a culture thing, I think, um, and a climate thing to be able to, you know, have a positive climate and culture so that when people do share information, it's you know reliable and accurate and um, to the best that we can we can do. Um, again, another thing interesting to me was the school produced communications at 48.48%. So almost 50% of the staff is getting their information from stuff produced in school. And I'm not, I'm not aware of what that information might be, um, but I'm curious to see what is it this, this schools are actually producing for staff um, that may be helpful to repurpose elsewhere or to inform us at the district office how we might be able to help um, get some information into those publications that they're producing at the school to pass along to staff as well if, if about 50 percent are going there and then again you see the tv station at 5.56 so we want to that's also you know echoes what the parents said what was that bottom one? I don't seek out any information. I don't seek out any information about district initiatives, events, etc. I think you Yeah, essentially that's what I guess that means, 2.02%. <laughs> I'm teaching math and that's it. This is, yeah, yes. The district TV station might be so low too because you have to live in Radnor to get it. True. And, you know, there's, there's a True. significant number of teachers that don't live in the district anymore. Yes. But you, it, it is broadcast outside, outside of Brown. It is. No, it is. Because I watch it up in Westchester. Oh. Oh, really? On what? On television. On Comcast? It's yeah. on Verizon. I have Verizon, Verizon, I guess. So. You can pick up a couple areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. seriously, I have. Can. Yeah. I get people I don't all know where the I don't know where the yeah. lines are drawn. I think you can pick Phoenix, up other districts outside. I don't know Phoenix, how far it goes. Phoenixville? Interesting. I watch Phoenixville on, yeah. on at home. We need to find you a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I watch yeah. I, what I, what he's got I, the triple play he's got the <laughs> premium uh, what I don't watch is our channel because our channel is very repetitive it goes over and over and over and over mm -hmm. again well when I was in well we had well when had Chuck and I not, when your son and I were in school together it wasn't it was for the kids to learn how to do TV production and put together right. videos and you know do all that it wasn't it it was not meant to be you know this public access informative and channel that, for this. You make a great point. Um, I mean, that's, that's the, that wasn't the mission of it when we started. Right. You know, when they it, put the TV it, studio. In. And it's you know what? It's important to clarify that 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 it was really made to be a place for kids to kind of learn how to do productions, and there wasn't really any um, thrust towards covering district events or district initiatives or school wide yeah. kind of things. You wanted the public to know about. It was I mean, mainly they put the meetings on there originally. To you know, you have twenty four seven to fill. You know, mm -hmm. so they, you know, what are we going to put? Well, let's put a school board meeting up. So that's what they did. Yep. But you now know, it's been... They've been like football games and, you know, putting them right, up. Right. So it's evolving. And I think a lot of other districts are doing the producing shows for the public to watch that inform them about what's happening in the schools. Yeah. And we can do that while the kids can still learn, students can still learn how to... So we work, I've been working with Mr. Bechtel, the principal, about trying to get some of the classes to do some projects that involve covering district events and school events, maybe make it a part of their grade. So there is movement towards... Yeah, because we don't want to take away from the, the mission of that. No. You know, and make it a school board channel, you know, because nobody wants that. Um, but, you know, the, the mission of it is to, to educate the kids on, you know, the TV medium. Yes. With another sleep initiative. If we exactly. Do more board meetings, yeah, we don't and we'll get those kids to bed at seven <laughs> if it's a school board <laughs> channel. <laughs> Michael, yeah, quick, one more quick question. The, the did you know section, did I miss that slide on here? I haven't put that slide in here for, um, out of realizing the time that we had to go over okay. this. Okay. Um, but we can go over it maybe when I'm done, getting through everything, if you wanted okay. to talk about that. Yeah, I just think that the purposes you of it came were. up with some takeaways from that so I just was wondering if I had missed it or just purposely not included yeah, it wasn't put in. Um, okay this here is the internal communication uh, responses which is what we had talked about as one of the major goals of this was to decide what's your level of satisfaction with internal communication within the building where you primarily work for the 
dissatisfied section, we have 22.8. And then in terms of the building where they work, and then across buildings in the admin building, 34.34. And for the very satisfied slash satisfied, 53 versus 32. So clearly we have work to do on, in all buildings on, on the internal communication. And that's just something that I don't think is too much of a surprise and just some feedback that I've gotten um, in recent months through different surveys. Okay, we're coming to the end here. Sure. Quick question sure. about that one. How is the communication between elementary schools? And I don't, I don't need an answer, but that would be very important for me to find out because yeah. they have the same, very similar mission. And uh, that would be nice to know how they communicate with each other. Okay. And I have one other thing because this is an, an initiative, and I think as a district this is something that maybe we are going to try to improve. But you have percentages here and you're going to do work to address some of the areas of need. Mm -hmm. So would it make sense to determine a time maybe when you want to do another survey and set some goals as to what you'd like to see those percentages be? We may not hit them, mm -hmm. but I think that that's something that's really helpful in any initiative we do is to say, here's where we are. This is our baseline survey. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back in two years, one year, three years, give us a sense of when, and what percentages you would like to see at that point based on changes you've made. And, of course, let us know what those changes are, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the purposes of the survey was to establish a baseline. So, obviously, we want to resurvey to see how we did against that baseline at some point. Um, Okay, so the next slide is to show you, this was a direct um, question to help us with our AR. It, it's asking, of the following sources of information, please select your top three in the order in which you would prefer to be informed about school and district initiatives and decisions that affect your work. 1A is internal email. 1B was face-to-face -face meetings. And 1C was a staff-only web page, which was a surprise, but I'm happy to see it because I think it's something we could easily accomplish. Um, I, they kind of already do that with a, um, a, a drive, a, a shared drive across the district where people can go and get their curriculum information and whatnot. But perhaps um, there's a web page we frequently update where we can post stuff that's just for staff. We give them in their own login, almost like what Schoology does but um, just for all, all staff across the district. So it's kind of an idea that we could maybe grow from the results here. Um, and then two, then the rest of them are district phone and email systems. So again, 2B and 3C are the school messenger system. So our staff will like us to use that um, more frequently. And then staff meetings are 2A and 3A. So this will allow us to kind of see where, where do, what channel should we use to distribute information. Um, so what's most, what's most desired by our staff, where to get that information. And then that 73.66 is the school messenger question. So it echoes the 83% or so of the parents that want us to use it. Although, as uh, Mr. Bachelor mentioned, that no does tick up as you get further down in the list of things that staff might want to know through the system, up to about 30% at the end. So the key takeaways, we went over these, but there, it's nice to see that there are some areas where we're doing well. The, the people love the website in terms of the information there. That they, they do see that there's a lot. Um, there's just, it's hard to mine through it. They really want it to be streamlined, um, organized in a, in a greater capacity. And we've already started work on doing that. I've been mapping the website in terms of the sections, the subsections, the teacher pages, what's on there, what could be taken off, what could be consolidated, how can we better organize it by subject and theme as opposed to department and teacher. Um, and I think that that's kind of the way that information online is going anyway. Um, and we might be able to shorten the content amount down significantly with that, that, that uh, project. Uh, yeah, mobile. When you, when you talk about the website, you're saying district and building website. You're going to group them together. Do we, uh, we don't have any data that's... Like, I always wonder, as a parent, I don't ever go to my district, my children's district website. I go to their building website, but I'm trying to think of the moments 
there have been few. Do we have any data to show that or? We do. We run on Google Analytics on all of our sites. So we'll be able to see, you know, the top, you know, we have 6,000 pages. So we can rank them by 1 to 6,000, what's frequently visited. And it turns out the district site is usually number one, um, high school number two, mm -hmm. and middle school number three. Um, it could be. It could be that somebody has. It could be that somebody had. Well, unless you sent, unless you said, yeah, unless you set your bookmark at the high school, you by default go to the district www.rtsa.org, and then you'll pick select the school and go to the high school. Um, so you will be getting more hits just by the nature of where the website takes you initially. Um, but the, we'll still have six separate sites. So we'll still have a district site and five schools. But perhaps we can re rearrange it in a way so that. It's just easier to get which people, a lot of the comments were, it's hard to find what I'm looking for. Um, it's there. It's just, there's a lot. We, we tend to put, we, we tend in this district to put, to say more is better and sometimes less and streamlined is better because it eliminates the choices. Where, where can I go now? Um, it also speaks to me that, that navigating the website, I've been in a couple PTO meetings where you've come in and you've shown people where different things are. So maybe, as opposed to just being invited in by the PTOs, I mean, maybe that could be something that you request as a beginning of the year habit. You go in and get some time on the agenda and show people, not that they have necessarily super robust attendance all the time, but find a way to get in there and show people some of those key things about to na in navigating the website, even in the open house or something like that, when you have a bigger audience, because that's so important. If that's where most people are getting their information, then maybe that's uh, something to institute to help help them along. Yes. Um, I think that applies to staff, too, I, I think. It does. And to that, we could use our television station to do a tutorial. And you could do a tutorial put it on our TV station so if somebody wants to know how to navigate our website you can just access that it'll be we need a schedule now it'll be scheduled on a certain certain time and they can watch it I think those are the things that we need to begin to look at mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. something like that um, and then a couple other things at the end here um, the day-to-day -day basis stuff academics curriculum things happening in the classroom um, I've already kind of identified this as a need to take some of the attention away from the great things that the, the, the that happen in the assemblies and um, extracurriculars, and, and devote some of our focus on the things that happen in the classrooms, uh, special lessons, unique th things that the teachers are doing. Um, really, kind of investigate and and get in there and maybe even talk to some of the students about you know what what was their experience today. And we have to talk with teachers about their comfortability with with all of this but I'm sure we can find some that we want to bring us in and say here's what I'm doing it's great I talk to some of my kids um, tell them tell my story so um, that that's something where we want to direction we want to take for the staff again the, the reader the newsletter is is a hit the website it, they they find that they get information they need from there they like school messenger um, the calendar they seem to be going there frequently and find it easy to access and find out what's happening um, again, we talk about consistency. Uh, it came through a lot, and the consistency really is if you have um, a one teacher, um, let's just say, who provides a weekly newsletter, because some do provide their own weekly newsletter, a snapshot of what happened in my classroom this week, um, some of the things we learned, and then your student goes to another class where the teacher never talks to you. Um, that's going to be a lot more jarring uh, for a parent to have that inconsistency than if neither or if they just both did something in the middle. Now, we can't have it across the board, and we don't want to prevent, obviously, our, our teachers from going above and beyond with how they communicate, but we can find a way maybe to provide them with a template, maybe to provide them with some sort of an easy thing to do to help them stay in touch with the parents. Um, and we, we, we're going to look into, into that a little bit. Um, and then I think face-to-face -face and staff meetings came through in terms of the staff and what they want to have when they're being delivered with some sort of a directive or a initiative or district goal um, instead of just getting it through an email or some sort of other um, you know letter in our office it'd be good to sit down and actually have a fall meeting and I know that Mr. Bachelor has been um, we've been talking about this since he came on about how we want to 
improve our communications and, and, and things. So I think we're on, on a good track. Um, and this is just gives us some more uh, background and information to work from. And then last but not least, the AR. So all the stuff that kind of came through the survey, um, some of it will be used just to kind of give us some idea of what we need to work on. Other, other information can be incorporated into the AR. I had, I had mentioned that during the presentation. But here are the sections that we currently see um, are options for the AR. Um, the logos, images, media relations, co communications restrictions, they existed in other policies or as guidelines. They can stay as guidelines for logos and images. However, I do see a lot of school districts put into their policy. If you want a logo from the district, if you want you know, to use it in a, in a publication outside of the district or branding somewhere, you have to ask for permission. So I, I would say put that somewhere on policy. Um, and the website guidelines and accessibility is, is something that came up recently and a need for us to address um, how people who may have trouble with seeing or mobile um, ability with their hands access our site so we'll have to put something in there that stresses our commitment commitment to making our site accessible to to those folks that's it well i just want to say thank you i think we i mean it was a big undertaking michael and a lot of great information it sounds like you have your work cut out for you and then some but okay. um Communication is really important, so thank you for all that you put into it. Um, the percentage, is that a, a, a version that we could get to make it easier to read? That was really helpful, how you translated those bar graphs into percentages. Sure. Yeah, can okay. you just, I, I know you're going to ask, can you update it to the website so that the public can see that too? Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks again for all the information. Um, can we see the comments, the, pub, the comments you got from people? Did I mean, did anybody take time to write in the, you know, box, you know, yes. if you've got more to say, say it. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious to see what they said, okay. you know. Chuck watches other school district meetings, you know, oh, yeah. maybe I'll read They're these, very interesting. you know, if I have to. <laughs> Trouble sleeping one night, you know. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so moving on to the next agenda item. <laughs> Mr. Kane, Mr. Kane. Uh, One of these take, days it'll be Dr. Kane. I'm going to take this opportunity to uh, bail out. Good for you. I had a, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, with the schedule change and everything like that, I, yeah, it another very, thing came up. So, right. well, we appreciate well, coming as long as we can. Thank you guys. Down. Just leave that up. Uh, because of time, uh, we're go I'm just going to highlight a couple uh, of the topics that are. Uh, on the DCIU legislative uh, update. So as you notice on the legislative update, it was shared today uh, with us. It's actually marked for May 3rd. So we're getting this before the actual DCIU uh, uh, board. Uh, but a couple of topics I just wanted to draw uh, people's attention to. Uh, one is the property tax reform events. Uh, if you notice, there are uh, five different events that are occurring. One's this uh, Thursday, uh, which is probably a little bit more of a distance than Lehigh Valley, which is the 19th. Uh, that's an opportunity to uh, hear from the Inter uh, Independent Fiscal Office regarding uh, the proposed uh, property tax reform. Uh, so you might want to, uh, people might want to avail themselves of uh, attending that if they're available. And not, the other one I wanted to speak about is in regards to uh, the handout that uh, Mrs. Goldman shared from PSEA in regards to uh, Senate Bill 383, uh, which specifically is speaking of, uh, uh, it speaks to um, employee gun possession or uh, possession in schools, uh, particularly firearms on uh, public school property. Uh, so in looking at the PSEA document that you shared, uh, or that was shared by uh, Mrs. McNally, uh, I then went on uh, PSBA's website to see what their stance is on uh, Senate Bill 383. And it's a little bit interesting because PSBA uh, suggests through their website that they're, they're uh, not necessarily opposed to this. Uh, they're, they're encouraged that uh, more uh, resources might be available to our schools. Uh, so. Um, it's something to uh, stay informed 
about is Senate Bill 383. So, excuse me, Kevin. So what you're saying is the PSBA is in favor of Senate Bill 383? They're in favor of additional choices. Uh, so this, they would consider this a choice is what, the, was what they're looking at. Interesting. That they're not taking a stance either way. I mean, you know, right. obviously gun rights is a very polarizing topic. So okay. uh, they're staying right in the middle. Um, the other topic, uh, which I thought was interesting, was House Bill 97, which is speaking to charter school reform. Uh, you know, when that uh, came, uh, when, when they did some uh, uh, polling on that, uh, I believe there were uh, over 20 amendments they were making to that. Uh, so that is something to keep, uh, we want to keep an eye on. Uh, we don't have many students here uh, in Radnor that participate in uh, charter schools. Uh, however, uh, you know, certainly uh, as goes the state, so goes Radnor. Uh, and it is uh, pulling uh, resources from uh, from uh, public education or from uh, uh, public school districts. Uh, lastly, uh, just a note I have regarding, and I spoke to this earlier regarding the federal role in uh, education, uh, and there was an executive order uh, signed on uh, April 26th, uh, which is asking Secretary uh, DeVos uh, to uh, study how the federal government has unlawfully overstepped state and local control in regards to uh, the Department of Education. And she has uh, 300 days to conduct that review and identify any regulations or guidance uh, that would be necessary uh, So uh, for changes. So that'll, that'll be coming forward. Uh, something that I thought was interesting. So in reviewing this, I went on uh, our state legislators, uh, you know, this, the House website and the Senate website, and a person that works uh, with them is uh, Peter Edgler, and he's a, uh, he's a research and instructional librarian uh, with the uh, Thomas Klein School of Law out, out of Drexel. Uh, so I just wanted to add, you know, I, so I emailed him uh, as a resource just to find out, you know, we, we, you know, we get these every month from the IU, and we know not many, you know, and uh, Mrs. Goldman, uh, Mr. Petiti and I watched Schoolhouse Rock, you know, how Bill Becomes a Law last month to get a little bit of an idea regarding how uh, how uh, how that works, and uh, well, you 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 watch conjunction junction. That's your function. Uh, but if you uh, in the handouts, uh, Mrs. Goldman also shared with us uh, making law in Pennsylvania, which is uh, a nice uh, sort of concise way in which uh, uh, the Pennsylvania uh, uh, legislative process works. Uh, but uh, what Mr. Edgler shared that uh, if you take into a into account all possible uh, laws that were uh, put forth through the last session, right? Uh, there were. You mean legis bills, legislation? Legislative bills that were put forth, just you know, similar to the ones we just right. spoke about. Uh, and the most recent data he had was 1516. So there was 3,848 bills. Um, when you're adding appropriation bills, you add another 31 on top of that. Uh, uh, 270 were. Uh, I'm sorry, 301 were actually a approved, so 7.8 percent of the bills that, that come through. So, so we recognize that uh, every month we do see a lot of, you know, somewhat controversial uh, topics that uh, a, uh, a, a legislator uh, uh, brings forth and puts a bill. Um, you know, certainly when I was in D.C. last week and we were meeting with the, the, the various legislators, um, oftentimes uh, constituents uh, or what uh, uh, want their a legislature to put forth a bill. For example, say I'm a legislator, Kevin, put, please put forth a bill on X. Uh, that is as simple as writing on a piece of paper and putting it in a box. You know, so there really isn't a lot that has to go into putting forth a bill, right? You know, so we just have to keep in mind that many of the bills that, you know, we see and, and we're sometimes surprised about uh, coming from, you know, some, since we started sharing the, the DCIU legislative update maybe last year around this time, uh, you know, only about 7.8 percent actually uh, go through the whole process. So, uh, but it is an interesting um, to, because you get an idea of where the different parts of the state fall in regards to uh, topics in education. So. Right, and I, I think that that information, I don't know if it's appropriate to put what you just said in the minutes or something like that, but I'd love to, that is a question that comes up a lot. I think it's really instructive to know 
that there are so many pieces of legislation that are put forth every session or every year and that not very few of them actually become law. I don't, so like I said, I, if we can sort of memorialize that somewhere, it would save having to dig up that information over and over again because I, and, and the source it with this gentleman. Yeah, I, I can forward the email to Patty uh, and then she can uh, get And we, you know, we bring up some of these bills, even though we know that they've got quite a journey to go on, because some of them, like Senate Bill 383, you know, it's been on the TV, it's been written about. So I think from what I gather, you, while we here at the table know that this isn't necessarily going to become law, I think part of our function as a, as a committee, and um, unless you feel differently, anybody here, um, is to help the public understand that this has a journey to go on. And when there's been a lot of media attention to a particular issue, whether it's tax reform or the guns in schools thing, that we, have a, we don't ignore it. We talk about it, and we help to educate the public about what it, where it fits into the scheme of things legislatively. So I, I think it's a good use of time. But if, if for some reason others don't, you know, feel free to speak up. Right. I also believe it's a good use of time. I think when we come up with this, uh, you know, the uh, 383, you may be opposed, you may be in favor of it, but it will open the conversation about what are we doing to protect our students. So I think that's what's important about informing different people about it. There are different ways you can go about uh, protecting your students, and it could be how often do we have lockdown drills. I mean, there's some, <clears throat> excuse me, there's bills in place that want to do that, to increase your um, the amount of times that you have lockdown compared to fire drills, and, and there are things like that, and it's all geared on the student protection. So this continues to allow us to look at it, and oftentimes things that we may want to do, we don't have the money to do. So maybe the state, I'm dreaming right now, maybe the state would come up with some things and then give us some money to do them. But again, I think the conversation uh, becomes meaningful to every district, whether you're going to arm your teachers or you're not. As a former teacher, I would not, repeat, not want to have a gun in my classroom. As a superintendent, I'm glad you're not caring. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, he didn't say that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but the... Um, <laughs> Uh, but in regards to, um, but but I mean, I, I, I honestly, uh, that, that's exactly what PSBA was saying. Yeah. You know, when I reviewed there, you know, I mean, you know, not every community is Radnor, right. uh, and so when you're uh, creating laws, you know, for 500 plus X number of charter schools, uh, you know, they have to look at everything. And so what PSBA uh, suggested is that you know, uh, again, they they weren't taking a stance pro or con. Uh, but, you know, really just saying that they are in favor of uh, increased options for school districts. So that, that, that really speaks to what you just said, Chuck. And you know what, Chuck, I think you made a really good point in what you said, and it makes me think of another bill that may never see the light of day, and that's the civics exam as a keystone graduation requirement. Whether or not that makes it to the governor's desk and is signed, to me, is almost secondary to the conversation that do we cover civics in a sufficient way so that our students would be able to pass an exam like that? So I think the benefit of bringing up this legislation isn't really whether or not it's going to pass, although sometimes the issues are so critical. I think we do want to get, a heads, get ahead of that. But it does, like you said, I thought very well, that it prompts conversations about other things related to the legislation that we want, may want to look at as a district. So, and. I, some of us, I think, just find it interesting to know what's on the minds of legislators because sometimes when you look through those legislative reviews, you're like, wow, where did that come from? I mean, there is such a wide array of ideas for laws that if for no other reason, it's good entertainment when you're having a meeting. <laughs> so um, anybody else have any comments or new business or before we move to our final public comment? Okay, let's see if there's, oh, you do? I, I do, because also, Kevin, could you talk about the tests and graduation requirements? 
Oh yeah, where does that, do you mean where does that stand in terms of the delay, Act well, 1, or? Well, I just want to hear somebody else talk about it because I have talked about it over and over and over again. And I was very impressed with the little write-up that's here. Are, are you in, uh, speaking in regards DCIU? to the, 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 well, the DCIU, Page but the, two? yeah, so the, this is just, this is coming from the Patriot News. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this is just speaking to the momentum is building in the Pennsylvania legislature to strike, uh, uh, or to take a, uh, the heart of controversial state testing for 1819. Uh, so it's growing, uh, you know, uh, bipartisanly. Now, I thought, I thought I, there was an actual bill in here that spoke to that. Uh, that was just the one in, in connecting to CTE's graduation right, requirements. So, so, so again, uh, uh, you know, I think that is one um, I mean, we, we've spoken about that a lot. We've taken stances on right, that, right. Uh, you know, as we, uh, you know, sort of encourage our community to uh, be proactive uh, in reaching out to their legislators. Um, you know, we, we've had conversations with ourselves with them uh, where they are very uh, supportive of what, uh, of, of the referendums that you guys, uh, that the board has put out. Um, but we also have to recognize too that you know other parts of the state, even area, even school districts close by, uh, are in favor of um, the, the graduation requirement. Uh, so it, it really just goes to the fact that we just need to keep we just need to keep the conversation open. Exactly. Well, what I liked about it because there are districts, um, Quakertown is one that has put that in there that their students need to pass the keystones to graduate. Um, and we were actually approached to uh, provide some information about what we do um, and how it impacts our district, but chose not to um, get involved with that because, and I'm not speaking for both of us, but we did have a conversation about it. And to me, the local school district should have the authority to put that in place if they want to. They want to. I don't agree with it, but I agree that they have the authority to do that since they grant the diploma. And um, so I, I just am thrilled to see something like this is moving forward. I think it's time we put a, as it says, put a stake through the heart of the controversial state rule <laughs> about Keystone. So I just, I just think that it just shows something that we have been part of and it's moving to accomplish it, so. And as they say in the TV business, I think we buried the lead because that has been such a topic of conversation. And I just got an email the other day from someone saying, what's the status of Act One? Who do you think, I mean, this is a nice blurb and I'll, I, I don't, I research the Patriot News article from April 25th, but who could we talk to to find out really what's going on with that? I mean, who has, would, would that be Dineman. Andy Dinneman or somebody? I mean, could we find out? Because I do think, again, like we've been talking about, mm -hmm. we talk about this stuff, right, and then right. if we think of it in the context of how that affects our students, they're probably wanting to know, yeah. like, is this going to be a graduation requirement or not? And with all of the work that we've, advocacy work we've done to try to take this graduation requirement away, would it be reasonable to put out an update to our students and families to say, here's the latest. I mean, I really think that that's a pressing issue and we could, you know, just bringing right. this up mm -hmm. brought up that whole other well, notion for me. I would also agree because it will have an impact on the budget mm -hmm. if we no longer had to remediate. Right. And that will have an impact on class size and it will have an impact on the amount of teachers that we have. So it's not some, not a big impact on that but it will have an impact. Absolutely. And it will have an impact on our students. And we're so, one yeah. school year away from when those students would be needing to yeah. go to this graduation mm -hmm. exam. And as I have said in the past, it's not going to happen. They're going to... <laughs> Did we place a wager on that? Uh, well, I don't think <laughs> we so. I'm not a wagering person. Oh, no wagers in school districts. No betting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I don't carry either. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that that is, again, Another example of where when we talk about this legislation, it's, it spawns other thoughts that are very useful to support our district operations. So thank you, everybody. Um, let's move to our final public comment. I see Ms. Bertle might. Yeah. Yes, no? Don't they have to start studying for the Keystones next year? 
preparing for it that's 1819? It's a course ending exam. So for example, if most of the students oh. take algebra, let's say in ninth grade, mm -hmm. they take to the test. Well, they're, they're supposed to be teaching algebra. And then when you learn algebra, you take the, key, the algebra keystone, you should pass it. But there are some kids who have issues with the way the testing is because it's, it's bubbles. Yeah. You know, fill in the bubbles. So um, I don't agree with Thank you, Mr. Petiti, for all the hard work. A thought after looking at the tiny little percentages on the RAD TV, whatever you call it. Is there a consideration in all that you're doing on these surveys about offering too much, too many different tools and ways to communicate if they aren't using the TV and, and a few of the others that are very close to it? Why not work diligently to make the product better of the ones that everybody, do we have to offer 20 choices when maybe five will do? is something that I wonder if you are also considering, seeing how the cost to keep a TV station going, although I understand it's being used to help the students who want to get into that business, but another way to look at it is uh, we're offering much too much and they just if, don't if, have if, the time If to I may, it. I also think that we need to see, especially for the TV station, what we get back from the public surveys. Because you have to remember, you know, 85% of our constituency are non parents in the district so it's very possible I don't that go. I don't go and I'm an it, it's very possible that some of those responses we get back will indicate people do watch it um, but well true well, then you are looking at that as a possibility of maybe too many offerings that no I, I mean that once a public survey comes out and the actual community members who may not have children in the district respond they may be watching the channel we right. don't know that but and if that, they're not then the consideration then we, then for we your have to, survey well, we have to take, be, take a hard look at all the stuff that that came back in the lower numbers. We don't have to give them the world if they're only using a state. I think if we, when we talk about the TV also, there are two different TV stations that you can get on your local channel, right? You can get the RAD TV, but there's also that Comcast slash Verizon channel, correct? No, it's exactly the same. RAD TV is what is the colloquial term for Comcast 31, Verizon 8, Eight. whatever okay. it is. Correct. So it's the, t it's the it's the school district's channel, is Rad TV. And then there's a is that the same channel. as the YouTube channel? And then there's another channel. You, yeah. YouTube, YouTube, uh, yes, the school district Rad TV has a YouTube channel called Rad TV, um, which gets a decent amount of views. I have the numbers on that, so it's in the tens of thousands. Um, so people do watch it on YouTube. Then there's the Radnor Township channel, which is where our board meetings that's, are televised live. That's what confuses. Right. That's five. See, you know, I just wonder if there's any confusion. I'm sure there is. Around when we say Rad, the Radner, however we refer to it in the survey, are they thinking Channel 5 or are they thinking Channel 8? Well, I put in parentheses the Radner Township School District channel, but it's possible people are confused as to what that is, and that's one of the things we need to make clearer. Right. Um, what, we also have another is. channel. We have Channel 21, which is another Radner. 30 and 31. Yeah. Yes, that's, so that's the uh, public we access. We need our channel. own TV access. guide. Right, right. Just well, for our that's district. That's what Michael was talking about. Yeah. We need a guide that would go on there that says, you know, what the, the meetings are being scheduled. Here it is, and, and you know, and the other different things. There's a question because there's also a, I think a county, uh, also there's a county channel, and I see that it seems that that's subcontracted to somebody else occasionally. And I was wondering, even though it's a broad, you know, if if that's something that is a um, possibility. I don't know about that county channel. Have to we, we, there is a county channel. Um, forget the number of it right now. But you're thinking of revenue. <laughs> yes, revenue. I am. Yes, I am. Mr. Pedee can ask that question. Yes. He's working right now with Comcast and things. So yeah. With Comcast. So yeah. I mean, we if we're not using it. And rent out our space. <laughs> yeah. If we're not. There should be some good things to come yeah, to the yeah, yeah. I don't want to just count again. I think that we just need to bring it to the 21st century a little bit. Yeah, I think so, too. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, th thank you, everybody, for a really yeah. interesting meeting and uh, good conversation. Meeting adjourned. Yeah. Very good.